Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering chapter 7 for our MCAT Behavioral Science playlist. This chapter is titled Psychological Disorders and we're going to cover the following objectives in this chapter. First objective is titled Understanding Psychological Disorders. Here we're going to compare and contrast biomedical versus bio psychosocial models of psychological disorders. We're also going to discuss how to classify disorders and then also talk about the most common psychological disorders in the United States. Then we're going to move into objective two titled types of psychological disorders. Here we're going to learn about many, many different types of psychological disorders. We're going to cover schizophrenia, depressive disorders, bipolar, anxiety disorders, OCD and related disorders, trauma and stress-related disorders, dissociative disorders, somatic symptoms, and personality disorders. And then our last and final objective is titled the biological basis of nervous system disorders. Here we're going to discuss the impact of depression on hormone and neurotransmitter levels. We're also going to recall the general features and risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And finally, we're going to explain the role of dopamine in schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. With that, we're going to go ahead and begin with objective one, understanding psychological disorders. The first order of business here is to compare and contrast the biomedical and the bio psychosocial models of psychological disorders. Psychological disorders, these are characteristics set of thoughts, feelings, or actions that cause noticeable distress to the sufferer. And they are usually considered deviant by the individual's culture, or they cause maladaptive functioning in society. That means that some aspect of the individual's behavior negatively impacts others or leads to self defeating outcomes. Now, many disorders can be treated once they're properly diagnosed. The process of defining these disorders varies, and there are two main classification systems that we're going to need to know for the MCAT. The first key concept for the MCAT in understanding psychological disorders is the biomedical approach. Here, this approach primarily focuses on treating these, these disorders through medical or biological interventions, oper operating under the assumption that disorders, they stem from physiological or biological disturbances, and it places a significant emphasis on symptom reduction. However, it's important to note that the biomedical approach has been critiqued for its narrow perspective because it fails to consider other vital factors like lifestyle or psychological aspects and social conditions. All these are important to consider when you're thinking about psychological disorders. For instance, when you're talking about heart disease, all right, heart disease. While the biomedical approach would focus on cardiac mechanisms, if you were following a simply biomedical approach, the doctor would overlook the roles of diet, lifestyle, and genetics. That is one of the critiques of this biomedical approach. It overlooks the importance of other factors and just focuses on medical or biological aspects and interventions. Now, to contrast this, we have the bio-psychosocial approach. This offers a more comprehensive perspective on diagnosing and treating psychological disorders. This method integrates the complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors. The biological aspect examines genetic predispositions or physiological conditions. The psychological component, this is going to look at the individual's thoughts, their emotions, their behavior. And finally, the social element is going to consider environmental influences like societal norms, class, and personal relationships. This model really approaches and aims to provide holistic treatment, encompassing both direct therapies like medication and counseling, 
and indirect therapies like the focus on enhancing the patient's support system. So for example, under this approach when treating depression, you will consider not only the genetic factors, but also the stress levels and social environment of the individual, and that's going to lead to a more comprehensive treatment plan. Overall, while the biomedical approach zeroes in on the biological and medical treatments, primarily aiming at symptom reduction, the biopsychosocial approach, it provides a more broader understanding. With that, we want to then redirect into talking about how to classify disorders. To aid clinicians in considering these factors, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, was created. Originally, the manual was written to collect statistical data in the United States, but it is now used as a diagnostic tool in the United States and in various other countries. This manual is currently in the fifth edition, which was published in May 2013, so the common abbreviation seen is the DSM-5. This manual is a compilation of many many psychological disorders, and the DSM-5's classification scheme is, it's not based on theories of cause or treatment of dis, dis, different disorders, rather it's really based on description of symptoms. And the last thing that we also want to touch up on is, well, based off of the DSM-5, what are the most common psychological disorders? And we're going to kind of hone in common psychological disorders in the United States. Suffering from a mental disorder obviously can be a very lonely experience because the disorder, it usually occurs only in the mind of the patient. However, the rates of these psychological disorders are higher than this experience would otherwise suggest. About 18% of people in the United States suffer from any mental disorders. Some of the highest are phobias at 9%. Social anxiety disorder at 7.1%, and major depressive disorders at 6.7%, and PTSD at 3.7%. If you feel like you are suffering from any mental disorders or you are seeking help, I am going to leave a couple of resources in the description box below. So please feel free to check them out. Take care of you. Take care of yourself. You are so important, and especially take care of yourself if you are studying for the MCAT. With that, we're going to go ahead and move into the second objective titled "Types of Psychological Disorders." First, we're going to cover schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Psychotic disorders, as classified in the DSM, they manifest through a range of symptoms that can be categorized into positive and negative types. So let's go ahead and cover that, starting off with positive symptoms. Positive symptoms, these are additional behaviors, thoughts, or feelings that are not typically present in normal behavior. Key positive symptoms include delusions. These are false beliefs that conflict with reality, and they are not shared by others in the same cultural context. They're also often maintained despite contradictory evidence. Examples include delusions of reference. This is believing that mundane occurrences are directed at oneself. They include persecution, which is the belief that the person is being deliberately interfered with, discriminated against, or plotted against. There's also the delusions of grandeur, which involves the belief that the person is remarkable in some significant way. Also, you'll see things like thought broadcasting, the belief that one's thoughts are being broadcasted externally, as well as things like thought withdrawal or thought insertion. Another Key positive symptom includes hallucinations. These are perceptions without an external stimulus, but they seem very real to the person. Auditory hallucinations are the most common, but you can see other kinds like visual as well. Another key positive symptom is disorganized thought. 
This is evident when a person's speech or thought process becomes incoherent, shifting very quickly between topics and very much lacking logical progression. Sometimes it can also manifest as word vomit or the creation of new words. And then last but not least, a key positive symptom can also include disorganized or catatonic behavior. This refers to abnormal behavior affecting daily activities, and it can also include severely decreased movement or very rigid posture. So that is positive symptoms. What about negative symptoms? These involve the absence or reduction of normal behavior or emotions. These can include things like blunting. This is a severe reduction in the intensity of affect expression. And disturbance of affect, this refers to alterations in the display or experience of emotion. And it can range from, you know, blunted to flat affect behavior. Blunted, like we said, is severe reduction in the intensity of affect expression. And flat affect is virtually no signs of emotional expression. It can also range into inappropriate affect, which is... The affect is clearly um, discordant with the content of the individual's speech. Another example of negative symptoms is avolition. This is a lack of motivation or inability to complete goal-directed actions. Now, the DSM-5, I'm going to scroll back up here. The DSM, it uses these symptoms for the diagnosis of psychotic disorders, with schizophrenia being the most recognized. Schizophrenia includes and involves a disconnect from reality, and diagnosis requires continuous signs of disturbances for at least six months, including at least one month of positive symptoms. The course of schizophrenia typically progresses through phases. You have your first phase, your prodromal phase. This precedes the diagnosis and it's usually marked with social withdrawal, peculiar behavior, and unusual experiences before moving into the active phase, which is characterized by evident psychotic symptoms, which are very crucial for diagnosis, before finally, hopefully, moving into the third phase, which is the residual and or recovery phase. This follows an active episode, often with increased clarity and potential concern or sometimes, worst case, depression as the individual realizes their previous state. Of course, the diagnosis of schizophrenia can vary based on the speed of symptom development. A rapid onset often leads to a quicker diagnosis and relatively better prognosis, whereas gradual development, that can make diagnosis challenging and it can typically indicate poor prognosis. The treatment and management of these disorders requires very much a comprehensive understanding of these symptoms and their impacts on individual life. Now, there are, of course, other psychotic disorders that differ from schizophrenia by the presence, severity, and duration of psychotic symptoms. As a general trend, the other psychotic disorders present symptoms to a lesser degree in comparison to schizophrenia. With that, we're going to go ahead and move into our next discussion on depressive disorders. While sadness is a natural emotional response to certain life events, such as the loss of a loved one, it is not in itself a mental disorder. Depressive disorders, however, are more severe conditions characterized by persistent and intense feelings of sadness that align with specific diagnostic criteria. To understand depressive disorders as per the DSM, it's essential to recognize the nine key symptoms of depression, and they can be remembered using the mnemonic sadness plus sig e caps. All right, so sadness is one of those first symptoms. This is a depressed mood and feeling of emptiness. Then we have sleep, issues with sleep, too little or too much. 
Um, also, interest, loss of interest or pleasure in activities. Then the other symptom is guilt. So feelings of unwarranted guilt or worthlessness. E is for energy. There's going to be a reduction in energy levels. C, concentration. This is another symptom. You're going to have difficulty in concentrating. A is appetite. Significant changes in appetite that lead to weight changes. Then you have psychomotor symptoms that can include psychomotor agitation. And then last but not least, suicidal thoughts, reoccurring thoughts about suicide. These symptoms are utilized also to categorize different types of depressive disorders. We're going to talk about three main ones. We have major depressive disorder. This is the first one. This disorder is characterized by the presence of major depressive episodes where an individual experiences five out of the nine defined symptoms, including either a depressed mood or loss of interest for at least two weeks. And these symptoms may significantly impair daily functioning. There's also persistent depressive disorder. This is diagnosed when an individual has experienced a depressive mood for most days over at least two years. It's important to note that major depressive episodes can occur concurrently with persistent depressive disorder. In such cases, a dual diagnosis is possible if the criteria for both severity and duration are met. Then there's also other depressive disorders. A, a common one is seasonal affective disorder. This is linked to the dark winter months and potentially related to abnormal melatonin metabolism. And it's usually treated with bright light therapy. There are also other kinds of depressive disorder disorders. There's premenstrual dysphoric disorder. This involves mood changes, often depressive that occur before menstruation and usually resolve afterward. And another kind that I want to make note of is postpartum depression, which occurs after childbirth. And it's attributed to the rapid hormonal changes that happen during pregnancy, during childbirth, after childbirth. Each of these disorders is unique in its characteristics, whether it be in terms of severity, duration, or the specific circumstance, uh, circumstances under which they manifest. Understanding these distinctions is crucial, of course, for accurate diagnosis and effective treatment of depressive disorders. With that, we're going to move into bipolar and related disorders. Bipolar and related disorders are marked by the presence of manic and depressive symptoms. Manic symptoms involve an elevated mood and increased activity, and these symptoms can be remembered with the mnemonic DIG FAST. D is for distractibility, difficulty in focusing on specific tasks. Eyes for irresponsibility, engaging in risky, impulsive behaviors. G for grandiosity, unrealistic feelings of superiority. F is for flight of thoughts. They have racing thoughts often reflected in very rapid speech. A, activity or agitation. This results in increase in goal-oriented activities or restlessness. S is for sleep, reduced need for sleep, and T is for talkativeness, excessive desire to talk. These symptoms, if present for at least four days with at least three of them occurring and not severely impacting social or work life, constitute a hypomanic episode. If these symptoms last for at least seven days or are severe enough to disrupt daily functioning, then this is considered a manic episode. Now, the diagnosis of bipolar disorders also hinges on the presence or absence of depressive episodes, which have been covered in the previous section. The key bipolar disorders include bipolar 1 disorder. This is diagnosed when there are manic episodes. And while it often includes depressive episodes, they are not necessary for a diagnosis. For instance, 
You can have two patients. Patient A may have only manic episodes and patient B cycles between manic and major depressive episodes. Both would actually be diagnosed with bipolar one disorder. Then we have bipolar two disorder. This is categorized by the presence of both a major depressive episode and a hypomanic episode, but not a full ma a manic episode. It's important to differentiate this from bipolar one disorder where both manic and depressive episodes occur. And so in short, again, bipolar, at least one episode of extreme mania lasting more than a week, tends to be milder than other bipolar types. What you have is a lot of increased energy, talkativeness, euphoria. Bipolar 2, you have symptoms of hypomania that are lasting at least four days, at least one depressive episode that's broken up by these periods of hypomania, and you're going to have a lot of different symptoms, including feelings of hopelessness, fatigue, anxiety, etc. There's also cyclothymic disorder. This involves manic and depressive symptoms that are not intense enough to be classified as full episodes. For a diagnosis, an individual must experience these symptoms for a majority of the time over a two-year period without meeting the criteria for a hypomanic or major depressive episode. Now, the neurological basis of mood disorders primarily centers around the monoamine or catecholamine theory of depression. And this theory suggests that mood disorders are linked to the levels of certain neurotransmitters in the brain, specifically norepinephrine and serotonin. According to this theory, an excess of norepinephrine and serotonin in the synaptic gap is believed to lead to mania, while a deficiency of these neurotransmitters is associated with depression. However, it's really, really important to note that recent research indicates that the relationship between neurotransmitter levels and mood disorders is way, way more complex than this theory suggests. With that, we're going to move into anxiety disorders. From an evolutionary standpoint, emotions like happiness and sadness have played a crucial role in modulating behavior in response to environmental stimuli. Disorders like bipolar and depressive disorders, they arise when the regulation of these emotions is inadequate, leading to symptoms. Similarly, anxiety disorders are related to the emotion of fear, specifically an excessive or irrational fear that disrupts daily functioning. Now, the DSM categorizes over 10 different anxiety disorders based on the specific situations or stimuli that trigger anxiety. There are one, specific phobias. These are irrational fears of specific objects or situations. There's also separation anxiety disorder. This involves excessive fear of being separated from caregivers or homes, leading to behaviors like refusal to leave home or extreme distress when separation occurs. There's also social anxiety disorder. This is characterized by a fear of social situations due to the belief of being negatively judged by others, and that leads to avoidance of social interactions. There's also panic disorders. These are defined by the reoccurrence of unexpected panic attacks, which are intense, sudden episodes of fear or discomfort, often with physical symptoms. There's also agoraphobia. This is the fear of being in situations where escape might be difficult, often leading to avoidance of various places or situations like public transport, open spaces, or crowds. Understanding these disorders really involves recognizing the underlying irrational and excessive fear or anxiety and how it impacts daily life. The categorization based on triggers helps in identifying and then treating these conditions effectively. With that, we move into a discussion on obsessive compulsive and related disorders.
Obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders encompass a range of conditions characterized by a cycle of obsessive thoughts and compulsive actions. Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, is a prime example of this. In OCD, individuals experience persistent, intrusive thoughts or impulses that generate anxiety or tension. And to alleviate this discomfort, they engage in repetitive tasks or rituals, even though they recognize these actions actions as irrational. There's also body dysmorphic disorder. In this condition, individuals have a persistent and unrealistic negative perception of their appearance, often fixated on a specific body part. And this preoccupation, it might not lead to significant uh, ritual behavior like OCD, but it can result in extreme measures like multiple cosmetic surgeries in an attempt to correct perceived flaws. There's also hoarding disorder. This is characterized by the compulsion to save or collect items regardless of their actual value, combined with a persistent difficulty in discarding possessions. This behavior may stem from beliefs about the future utility of the items or a perceived responsibility to care for them. In summary, Obsessive compulsive and related disorders are marked by a cycle of obsessive thoughts and compulsive actions that are disruptive to daily functioning. Now we want to move into trauma and stressor related disorders. The category of trauma and stressor related disorders in the DSM is defined by disorders that originate from a traumatic event, which is essential for diagnosis. The typical response to trauma involves fear, helplessness, and anxiety. However, in these disorders, individuals exhibit additional maladaptive sy uh, symptoms like loss of pleasure, general dissatisfaction with life, aggression, or even dissociation. Now, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, this is the most recognized disorder within the category, and it develops following exposure to a traumatic event like war, sexual assault, natural dis dis disasters, or even life-threatening situations. The disorder manifests through various symptoms categorized into four groups. Those four groups are one, intrusion, two, arousal, three, avoidance, and four, negative cognitive symptoms. What are these? Intrusion symptoms, these include recurrent reliving of the event, flashbacks, nightmares, and prolonged distress. Arousal symptoms manifest as an increased startle response, irritability, anxiety, self-destructive behavior, and sleep disturbances. Avoidance symptoms are deliberate efforts to avoid memories, people, places, activities, or objects that are associated with the trauma. And negative cognitive symptoms involve difficulty remembering key aspects of the event, persistent negative emotions, a feeling of detachment from others, and a bleak view of the world. Now, for a PTSD diagnosis, these symptoms must be persistent for at least one month. If they last less than one month, but more than three days, the condition may be termed acute stress disorder. From a behavioral perspective, PTSD symptoms are linked to the traumatic event and the individual's reaction to it. Intrusion and arousal symptoms can be understood through classical conditioning, where the event becomes associated with traumatic triggers and extends to everyday stimuli. Avoidance symptoms are seen through the lens of operant conditioning and avoidance learning, where individuals learn behaviors to steer clear of unpleasant stimuli or responses. And negative cognitive symptoms, they can be considered a form of dissociation, a defense mechanism that's used used to evade this distressing trigger or stimuli. This view helps in understanding the underlying psychological mechanisms contributing to PTSD and similar disorders, really emphasizing the profound impact of trauma on mental health. Now we move into dissociative disorders.
Dissociative disorder represents a unique category in mental health where patients cope with stress by detaching from parts of their identity while still maintaining a grasp on reality. This group includes dissociative amnesia, dissociative identity disorder, and depersonalization disorder. Now, dissociative amnesia is characterized by an inability to recall important personal information, usually following a traumatic or stressful event. This amnesia is not due to a neurological disorder. A subset of this disorder is dissociative fogu, where individuals may suddenly travel or wander away from their regular surroundings, often assuming a new identity and forgetting their previous one. Dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, this involves the presence of two or more distinct personality states or identities within a single individual. These different identities may control the individual's behavior at different times. DID is often linked to severe trauma, especially during early childhood. Treatment may involve integrating these separate identities into a single cohesive identity. Then we have depersonalization disorder or derealization disorder. This involves a persistent feeling of detachment from one's own body and thoughts or from the surrounding environment, hence depersonalization and derealization respectively. This can manifest as feeling like an observer of one's own life or feeling like the world around them isn't real and very dreamlike. Importantly, even during episodes of depersonalization or derealization, individuals do not experience psychotic symptoms such as delusions or hallucinations. Overall, dissociative disorders involve a very complex interplay between memory, identity, and perception, often as a defense mechanism against severe stress or trauma, and these disorders can significantly impair an individual's ability to function and engage in daily activities, yet they maintain an intact sense of reality. So with that, we finish dissociative disorders and move into somatic symptoms and related disorders. Somatic symptoms and related disorders encompass conditions where individuals experience bodily symptoms that cause significant distress or impairment in their lives, irrespective of whether these symptoms are linked to a medical condition. We're going to talk about a couple starting off with Somatic symptom disorder. This disorder involves one or more somatic symptoms that may or may not be related to an identified medical condition. The key characteristic is an excessive focus on these symptoms leading to significant anxiety or distress, disproportionate concern about their seriousness, and a high level of time and energy devoted to them. The individual's response to the symptoms is the central aspect rather than the symptoms themselves. We also have illness anxiety disorder. This disorder is marked by a preoccupation with the fear of having or developing a serious illness. Individuals with this disorder exhibit a high level of anxiety about their health and their response may manifest in two ways, either excessive health-related behaviors like constant checks for signs of illnesses or complete avoidance of medical care out of fear of discovering a serious illness. This condition differs from somatic symptom disorder in that the physical symptoms are either mild or non-existent, but the worry and anxiety about having a medical condition are predominant. Then we have conversion disorder as well. This disorder features neurological symptoms such as paralysis, blindness, or other um, deficits in sensory or motor functions that can't be explained by medical or neurological conditions. The onset of these symptoms often follows significant stress or a traumatic event. Interestingly, patients might show a lack of concern for their profound symptoms. The symptoms of conversion disorder may also have symbolic links to the underlying emotional issues or traumatic events. With that, 
we move into personality disorders. This is the last thing we want to cover in objective two. Personality disorders are enduring patterns of behavior and inner experience that deviate substantially from the expectations of the individual's culture. They are pervasive and inflexible, leading to distress or impaired functioning. These disorders are egocentric, meaning the behaviors are in harmony with the individual's self-image and are often perceived as correct or normal by the person. Now, the DSM categorizes 10 specific personality disorders into three clusters based on their similar characteristics. The cluster A personality type or disorder are all marked by behaviors that is labeled as odd or eccentric by others. Three examples here include paranoid personality disorder, schizotypal personality disorder, and schizoid personality disorders. The paranoid personality disorder is marked by a pervasive and strong distrust of others and suspicion regarding their motives. The schizotypal personality disorder refers to a pattern of odd or eccentric thinking. And finally, schizoid personality disorder involves a detachment from social relationships and limited emotions. It's a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships, and also a restricted range of emotional expression. So people with this disorder, they show little desire for social interactions. They have few to no close friends, and they have very poor social skills. Then we have cluster B. This encompasses disorders that are seen as dramatic, emotional, or erratic. We have four examples here. We're going to talk about antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorders. Antisocial personality disorder is more common in males. It's marked by a disregard for others' rights, often manifesting in illegal acts, deceit, and aggression. Then we have borderline personality disorder. This is more frequent in females. It involves instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image, and affects, often coupled with intense fear of abandonment and impulsive behaviors. Then we have histrionic personality disorder. This is characterized by constant attention-seeking, emotional overreaction, and seductive behavior. And then last but not least, narcissistic personality disorder involves a grandiose sense of self-importance, need for admiration, and a lack of empathy, often hiding a very fragile self-esteem. Then cluster C, this contains disorders described as anxious or fearful. The three examples we're going to talk about is avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Avoidant personality disorder is characterized by extreme shyness, fear of rejection, and feeling socially inept despite a desire for social interaction. Dependent personality disorder manifests as excessive need for reassurance and dependence on others for decision making. And then last but not least, we have obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which involves a preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, control, and adherence to rules. It differs from OCD in its egocentric nature and lack of true obsessions and compulsions. And with that, we move into our last and final objective, the biological basis of nervous system disorders. The MCAT expects students to understand the biological basis of certain mental disorders, including schizophrenia, depression, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. So let's go over them, starting with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, this is a disorder that's believed to have a genetic component, but factors like birth trauma and environmental factors like excessive marijuana use during adolescence are also risk factors. The risk for first degree relatives of a person with schizophrenia is significantly higher than in the general population. Schizophrenia may involve structural brain changes and it is closely associated with an excess of dopamine, leading to the use of neuroleptics or antipsychotics that block dopamine receptors to treat it. 
Now for depression and bipolar disorder, well, depression, this has several biological markers, such as high glucose metabolism in the amygdala and high levels of glucocorticoids like cortisol. It's also associated with decreased levels of neurotransmitters, especially norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. Now, bipolar disorders, they have distinct biological factors and genetic links with increased risks observed if a parent has the disorder. It's associated with increased levels of norepinephrine and serotonin. Now, Alzheimer's disease, this is common in individuals over 65, particularly women. It is marked by memory loss, disorientation, and difficulty with abstract thinking. Genetics play a role with mutations in specific genes being linked to the disease. Alzheimer's patients often show ba uh, brain atrophy, enlarged ventricles, reduced acetylcholine, and choline acetyltransferase levels, in addition to reduced metabolism in certain brain regions. Now, beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrial uh, tangles of tau proteins are characteristic biological markers as well. There's a lot of research going on in this area right now. Lastly, we have Parkinson's disease. This is characterized by slowness in movement, resting tremor. This is a tremor that appears when muscles are not being used. Pill rolling tremor. This is flexing and extending the fingers while moving the thumb back and forth as if rolling something in the fingers. They also are have uh, mask-like facies. This is a facial expression consisting of static and expressionless facial features um, and partially open mouths. Also, another symptom is cogwheel rigidity. So there's muscle tension that intermittently halts movement as an examiner attempts to manipulate a link, uh, a, a limb, I'm sorry. Now, a common but not characteristic symptom of Parkinson's disease is depression. Dementia is also common in Parkinson's disease. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that Parkinson's disease is primarily caused by decreased dopamine production, and this impacts the role in movement initiation and smoothness and the part that has this role is the basal ganglia. Treatments like L-DOPA, which is converted to dopamine in the brain, and stem cell therapies have been explored to manage and potentially reverse its effects. That is everything that we wanted to talk about in this objective. Obviously, understanding these biological underpinnings is crucial for future medical students and physicians as it informs both the diagnosis and the development of treatment for these disorders. I hope this video was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.